Hey folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, and I hope you'll pardon my appearance. I'm, I'm kind of covered in sawdust today. I just got finished cutting out the plywood sub roadbed for my ON18 Bandit Canyon Railway project, and that's what I'm working on again this week. This is some uh, nice furniture grade, uh, half inch thick plywood. I cut this out with a jigsaw. I'm really not going to go into a whole lot of detail about how I did this. It's pretty basic stuff. In fact, I covered a lot of it in earlier vid videos that you might have seen, like when I did uh, Calico Mountain. And if you haven't seen the Calico Mountain build, you can uh, check that out right up here. Uh, but this week, what I want to do is uh, get this uh, plywood sub road bed installed at its proper level of about 52 inches up above the floor. Then I want to get some cork road bed on here. I've got some N-scale uh, Midwest cork road bed that we're going to be using for our ON18 road bed. And then even get some track laid and possibly, if there's time, add some feeder wires and get some trains running. So let's get started on this right now. Now to get this up to the level that I want it, I'm going to use some one by 2 risers. And I've already gone ahead and cut these also. Uh, this is just some scrap 1x2 material I had laying around, and so I've cut them all to uh, 20 inches in length, which will, with uh, plus the half an inch uh, of the subroad bed, will bring it up right to 52 inches, which is right where I want to be. Um, and, you know, that, that height works well for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, I found it's a, just the ideal height for me to work on on the layout and also to view the layout from. I really like it. It's just below eye level. And uh, the other reason is, uh, since this is going to be parked most of the time right across from the Thunder Mesa layout, it'll make a nice continuation visually of the layout when looking at it from the other side. It'll be like another little piece of scenery over here that'll match up with the existing layout. So I think the first thing I want to do is um, kind of mark on the top of the base here with a pencil where the uh, outline of the sub road bed is going to be. And this will tell me where to position those risers so that they, uh, they made up with this. You might notice that I uh, left myself a lot of... Uh, plywood real estate. It's not just the outline of the of the track roadbed. A lot of scale real estate up here and that's uh, mostly for the structures that are going to go on the layout. Um, place for them to sit. Nice firm base for those. Uh, it also having more material like this on a small layout uh, gives me more attachments point, more attachment points for those risers that I'm going to put in, and it'll make an overall uh, more stable layout when all is said and done. And I want these risers to be as uh, straight and level as I can get them. Not bad. And to attach them, I'm going to use some uh, one and a quarter inch drywall screws, but I'm going to attach them all from the back side. So once again, I don't have screw heads showing. Uh, from the front of the layout. It's fairly easy to keep these straight and level uh, in the corners, but they're just kind of hanging out here. It's a little bit more of a challenge. doing anything too scientific to line this up just kind of eyeballing it the best I can there we go now I 
can start uh, screwing the deck down to the risers. I'm just going to go right through the, the half inch plywood, but I'm going to uh, avoid as much as possible uh, my track center line so I don't have screw heads underneath that. Start out here on the corners, I think. Going through my jar of recycled drywall screws. I never throw anything away. <laughs> To the opposite corner next. Make sure everything stays lined up where I want it. Ooh, time for a new battery. That's better. So I've gotten to the last one. And uh, I noticed it's just a little bit of a gap here. I might have uh, put it in a little bit lower than the other ones. I don't know if you can see that. See? About a sixteenth of an inch. Now, if I was to screw this down on there, uh, that would throw the, the bed, the subroad bed, out of level. And especially once I uh, remove this piece, uh, for the bridge that's going to be across here, this side would be higher than that side. So rather than do that, I'm just going to shim it. I've got some 16th of an inch thick uh, stock right here. I'll just put that in and drill right through it. So that should keep everything more or less on the level. Not bad. So the only thing holding these two pieces together right now are these two pieces of road bed, which is, are where the bridges are going to go across the canyon. And those are going to be cut out um, before I lay the track, actually. I'm going to do the, uh, the cork road bed, and then we'll cut these out. And these two sides will have to stand on their own. I've already cut through from each side more than halfway just to make it easier because I'm probably going to have to use a coping saw, a hand saw to uh, cut these the rest of the way through. So that's just to provide a little bit of extra strength on here while I get the sub road bed in place. Okay, I'm gathering up everything I think I'll need here to, um, to do the cork road bed now. Yeah, I've got some, uh, some wood glue. Uh, paintbrush to spread it around, some thumbtacks, and most importantly, some Midwest cork roadbed. This is a uh, N-scale cork roadbed, which works uh, equally well for HON30 or ON18, any 9mm gauge. It's a nice, uh, nice width for that, and it, you know, helps deaden the sound a little bit, and uh, raises the uh, the height of the track up to a more prototypical level than just putting it down here on the, on the ground, which is what the plywood represents. Now these are some fairly tight curves here. <laughs> in fact, some of the tightest I've ever done. I think these are the tightest I've ever done in O scale for sure. These are uh, eight inch radius curves, which um, is tighter than anything I ever did on calico. I think I did 10 inch on those. So anyway, I like to start with the, uh, the inside strip of roadbed, just following the track center line. And when something is, is uh, you got a curve as sharp as this, you're gonna need to use a lot of tacks to hold this in place until the glue dries. Probably one about every inch. Now that I've already got my curve established 
makes it really easy to go back and put in the outside piece of the roadbed. And since this cork roadbed comes in uh, three foot lengths or meter lengths, it gives me an excellent idea exactly how much, uh, how much track I'm going to need also. Because the flex track also comes in three foot or meter lengths. that didn't take very long at all. Now I can just uh, let the glue dry overnight, come back tomorrow, we'll pull out all of these pins and start laying some track. And just like that, it's the next day. Uh, so I'm taking out the, uh, the thumbtacks here, revealing the nice cork road bed underneath. This is one of my favorite parts, actually. <laughs> Always looks so nice and clean when this is done. Now I've got some 400 grit sandpaper in my sanding block. And I'm just going to go around, make sure the, uh, the surface of the cork roadbed is just dead smooth. And I also want to come and get this inside edge. You know, if you've used cork roadbed when you split it, one side usually has a really nice bevel on it and the other side um, comes out a little rough. You could just take some sandpaper and go around and bring that bevel back on, on that edge. And if you don't do this step, um, a lot of times when you go to, to ballast the track later, you'll get a little lip right here that the ballast won't cover just because you've got an overhang. Now I think it's safe to cut these bridges out. Just gonna use my coping saw. Well, that was easy. And now we can start laying some track. And once again, I'm using some Pico uh, HON30 Flex Track. Uh, I like it a lot better than uh, your standard N-gauge track because, as you can see, the ties are much larger and um, spaced further apart for HON30. But they also uh, look just right in ON18. The rail itself, by the way, is Code 80. Just about the same you'd find on any usual uh, end scale flex track. Let's start right here on this straight section across the, the canyon. Um, and I'm using the same basic technique I used over on the calico section to lay track. And that is, I'm uh, using some rail spikes like you would use for a uh, hand laying track. What I like to do is just put them right through the ties where the molded in spikes are. Do a little pilot hole here. Put that in the jaws of our rail spiking tool and drive that right down in there. And these are some um, micro engineering small rail spikes that I'm using. So what I'm doing is I'm lining them up with the molded in uh, spikes on the flex track so that when everything is painted and ballasted uh, you you won't really be able to see these at all. They just blend right in and just push it the rest of the way down into the plywood. Now on curved sections I want to put them a little bit closer together then uh, on the straight sections, about every fourth 
tie probably for a curve this sharp. I find this looks a lot better than a, a big old track nail right in the middle of the, uh, the track. It's much easier to disguise this. Now the natural inclination would be, you know, once we reach this curve is just to continue to uh, curve this track around. But I really don't want to do that because you can see where this piece of flex track ends. It'd be, you know, right in the middle of this curve. And on really sharp curves like this, uh, it is so much easier and better to use one complete piece of track all the way around rather than try to put a joint uh, somewhere on that very sharp curve. It's just going to create problems down the road if you do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my rail nippers. These are flush cut nippers and um, trim this track off right here where it's still straight. Pull that tie out. There we go. And now I can solder this joint uh, on the straight section and I use one uh, complete piece of track to go all the way around here. Now this is code 80 rail, as I mentioned. So I want to use some code 80 rail joiners, which I just happen to have right here handy. So I've got those on there ready to receive a nice fresh piece of flex track. Now before I solder this rail joint, I'm going to do something to make my life a lot easier. I'm going to spike it down on the opposite side of this joint right here. So it doesn't move around while I'm trying to solder it. But you don't want to start curving the track until after that joint is soldered. Now the secret to soldering is really just being prepared, having everything you need right there, and also uh, making sure the area that you want to solder is clean. No uh, oils from your fingers or uh, glue or paint or anything like that on there. And to solder 80, uh, Code 80 rail like this, you're going to need some fast uh, fast direct heat and I'm using some um, uh, 60 40 rosin core lead solder which is excellent for uh, electronics and for uh, structural strength I put a little bit of uh, um, flux on there uh, to help the solder flow and I'm using my uh, my butane torch for this but I've got a soldering tip on the end tin the end of it there a little bit doesn't take very much solder. Just like that. There we go. Clean that up with a little damp sponge or paper towel. And I can uh, continue now bending this around the corner. This is now like one solid piece of track. Those are nicely welded together. Well, now I need to put this turnout in right here and um, flip the layout around so you can see it better. Um, this is a potential trouble spot because you've got a curve coming right into this turnout. This turnout, by the way, is a Shinohara, a Lambert Shinohara uh, HON30. It's like a, this is about an 8 inch radius curve coming off of here. So super sharp, about the sharpest you can get. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know that these are available anymore. I, in fact, I don't think that they are. Uh, I got, I had a pair of these that were given to me by a friend, and I'm happy to have them. So you can get some um, some uh, HON30 turnouts from Pico, however, if you want to use those. So um, I can't solder this joint right here because 
um, that would create a short. This is what's known as a live frog turnout, a power routing turnout. So you can only feed power from this end. You can't feed it from uh, the diverging end, the frog end, because uh, that will uh, cause a short circuit. So we have to use a pair of insulated rail joiners right here. I'll cut these down, and these are code 80 insulated rail joints. I think these are from Atlas. There are lots of different ones out there. Now, unlike Pico turnouts, these points are not sprung, so I'm going to need some method of uh, throwing the turnout and keeping the points tight against the rails, and I'm probably just going to use like an N-scale uh, caboose ground throw for that. So I need to drill a hole into this throw bar that I can uh, put some music wire through. Make sure I get this good and solid on both sides of this insulated joint. On the uh, diverging track here that goes to the spur, I don't need to use um, insulated rail joiners because, as I mentioned, this is what's known as a power routing turnout, so it acts like an on-off switch. Um, if I don't route any um, layout power to this track, uh, it'll only have power when the points are thrown for it, and it'll be turned off uh, and have no power when the points are thrown the other way. For the main line. So I'm going to take advantage of that feature and I can use this to park another locomotive or whatever without it having to do any fancy wiring. So I added another strip of cork roadbed out here to kind of even that out and make it look a little better. I've also built up a pad right here for the, uh, the ground throw which will go right there. So we'll end scale ground throw. We'll be installing that shortly, but first I need to solder on another piece of track right here to come around this curve. And yes, we are going to solder this joint. A little dab will do ya. But now, with that done, I can just bring this the rest of the way around. Join it up in that short straight section, which is going to be uh, inside the mine building. Now, for this final rail joint on this uh, this section right here uh, to close the loop, I'm not going to solder these connectors right here. I'm just going to leave some rail joiners on there and leave a little gap between the rails, uh, and that's to allow for seasonal expansion and contraction. It's uh, winter time now while I'm doing this, so. Um, when the weather warms up, this nickel silver rail is going to expand just a little bit. So I'm leaving just a little gap with the rail joiners there um, so it can do that without buckling the rail. Okay, well the track is laid, so now it is time, I think, to hook up some feeder wires, get some power to these rails. Um, this, uh, this layout is going to be just standard DC, uh, nothing fancy. Uh, no uh, digital command control DCC like I have on the Thunder Mesa layout. And I picked up um, a Bachman controller at a yard sale. I've used these before. They work just fine. Uh, the thing I like about it is the transformer is actually a separate uh, wall wart, so you can plug and unplug it real easily. Um, this is the hookup wire to the track. So I'm going to need, it has this plug on here, I'm going to need to snip this off, first of all. Now I've got a spot mark where I want to bring the feeders up, and I'm just going to drill a couple of holes right through, right through the road bed, right through the sub road bed, right next to the rails, very carefully. should be able to feed these wires up through the bottom, through these holes. One, two. Okay. 
A little more than that. Okay, this is some stranded copper wire. So I'm just going to twist it. Bring that down right against the side of the rail, right below the top in the webbing. If I can get it to stay there. All right, well, I didn't make too big of a mess of that. Now, before I turn the power on, I actually want to finish work on this turnout so it's functional. I'm going to add a, uh, this is a Caboose Hobbies N-Scale ground throw. I modified it a little bit. I drilled a hole in that end. There's a matching hole in the draw bar on the turnout. I modified the turnout with a pair of uh, four by sixes to extend these long ties out so I have a place for the switch machine to stand or the, the ground throw. Well, now I need to create a linkage between the draw bar and the ground throw. And I've got a piece of music wire for that and I bent it uh, L-shaped this way and another one that way so I can take and hook this down inside the hole in the draw bar. Oops. And then kind of crank it around so it'll have a positive grab in there and not pop out uh, when there's outward pressure on the wire. In retrospect, of course, this would have been a lot easier to do, to put the wire in anyway, before the turnout was installed. Right? Hindsight is 2020, as always. There, I got it. Okay. So now that's in that end. I need to measure the length. There. Okay, put in another L bend in this. Like so. Trim that off. So that end goes into the all on the ground throw. Like so now I can mount the ground throw, give myself plenty of room so my fingers don't uh, knock over the rolling stock and the rolling stock doesn't hit the ground throw. So more than enough clearance. With any luck, this will actually work. Now uh, these uh, extended ties, those are going to be painted uh, the same color as the rail when I paint the rail, so won't, uh, the contrast won't be quite so bad. It'll all blend together. Okay, now that should work. I love it when a plan comes together. Before I test this out with any trains, I'll take an extra little precaution, add a couple of foam core temporary bridges here, just in case anything wants to take a dive into the canyon below. And I'll give the track a quick clean with a little rubbing alcohol. This is my favorite track cleaner, by the way. It's a, just a wine cork with some soft cotton wrapped around it, piece of old t-shirt material. Works great. All right, plug in the wall wart. Let's take it out for a spin. Now, before I use any of my nicer ON18 models, I'm gonna experiment uh, first with this little N-scale uh, switcher. Because if it falls down to the canyon floor, you know, I won't cry nearly as much. Okay. 
I think it's safe to try some uh, some ON18 equipment now. You stop right there. Let's see how the Big Thunder and Calico number five, the uh, Herb Ryman, does on here. Now I'll be creating some new rolling stock locomotives for uh, Band of Canyon Railway, but in the meantime, I think this should work all right. And I'll be standing by to catch anything that falls off. There goes nothing. <laughs> yes. the switch. A little rough, I can fix that. Ooh, don't want to go too far. And that's going to wrap it up for this one. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you want to see more. You can also follow Thunder Mesa over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and find out what's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really like what we're doing here on the channel and want to show your support, head on over to patreon.com slash thundermesa, just like these folks did, and show your support there. Until next time, Keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now. This is so fun.